Yes, folks, it's Tales uh, from the Jails here with John G. Sutton. Yeah, I want to talk today about the administration of drugs in prison by the hospital service. When I was there, it was run specifically by the Home Office and using prison staff. Please do like and subscribe down here. And also you'll see there's a link to my interview with James English and a link to my interview with, with Sean Atwood. Yeah, big interviews, tens of thousands of, 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 of views there. So I'm sure they must be all right. Okay, now as I said, uh, when I was there, it was hospital officers that administered the medication. And uh, during a recent interview, I pointed out that uh, a lot of the prison staff who were hospital officers, like myself, would administer the medication uh, and things like Largactyl would come in liquid form and they would put it into 10 mil tots. So they'd get like uh, 50 milligrams, 10 mils of 50 mil Largactyl, whatever it was. And they'd give them 10 mils and a (coughs) cough, yeah? I personally wasn't involved in this but I saw this many many times pointed it out to the staff you know that this is uh, they're walking around like bloody zombies you know well bollocks to them you know leave us alone you know that kind of attitude and uh, indeed when the prison went into riot uh, at strange ways in 1990 April 1990 uh, and the Offenders on the roof were charged with mutiny and uh, criminal damage. Uh, The solicitors and barristers acting on behalf of the people who were charged requested that I go to Crown Court and give evidence against them. And indeed I did that. And during my evidence I pointed out that uh, the, the hospital system in the prison was actually broken and that the staff, along with the doctors, were complicit in actually maladministering medication. I did point this out, <clears throat> just to clear anybody's ideas up, you know, that we, we don't know what we're talking about. But today, it's not administered by hospital officers. It's not administered by the Home Office itself. It's administered by the National Health Service within the prisons. Now, from what I'm told from people who are serving in the prisons now, it's an utter shambles. It's a disaster because you've got, I don't know, young young ladies in there acting as uh, hospital officers that I, I was doing. And, uh, of course, you've got the same kind of inmates in there, except more and more and more of them these days are addicted to uh, drugs. So they come in high on cocaine or whatever it is that they've been taking. Is it crystal meths and crack and smoking all sorts of stuff? They get into prison and they're coming down off this. Of course, uh, they can be quite aggressive and dangerous. Uh, As I previously mentioned before, watch this program on television. It seems very factual to me at time that the series two, it shows a a young female inmate who's come in uh, addicted to uh, cocaine and having great difficulty dealing with the situation in the prisons and having it smuggled in. The problem with smuggling drugs in of course is you don't quite know what you're getting and uh, whatever you're getting you could be overdosing and uh, basically the staff don't know what you've taken because let's be honest you don't know what you've taken yourself if somebody's thrown it over the wall one of the tricks that they were using uh, in in the prisons was dead pigeons yeah so they rip the guts out of the dead pigeons, stick the drugs inside, stitch them up and throw them over the wall so that the uh, the cleaning patrol in the mornings would know where to look because they'd be previously told there's going to be a dead pigeon thrown over the wall, get it, there's drugs inside there and uh, get it back inside the prison. 
that's how one of the methods was. But you can imagine, uh, if that's one of the methods, I mean, it's hardly uh, sanitary, is it? I mean, it's hygienic to do things like that. And people are taking this and ingesting it. And they wonder why people are running around strange ways and all the big prisons stoned out of their heads on spice and crack and whatever else that they've been taking. And when they come to see the, the prison hospital staff, they're no longer hospital officers who have got some vast experience of dealing with dangerous inmates. They are NHS nurses, female nurses, who are faced with a potentially seriously aggressive inmates. And uh, so it's all falling to bits. Seeing the King's speech, he's saying there's going to be more use of imprisonment. How? Who is going, who is going to uh, uh, administer this? Where are they getting the staff? I had one idea, and I seriously, seriously advocate this, that they remove all inmates out of the prison who are doing less than 12 months, start at six months, get them out, yeah. They're not going to do any harm. I mean, they're not only going to be coming out anyway very, very soon, so they might as well go out early, get them out. That'll clear you 10,000 places. Then you do not sentence anybody. You change completely the sentencing pattern and all the, the, the series that you can start with the minimum sentence will be three years so that if you offend uh, uh, say you, you offend three times like america on your third offense it might be something stupid like uh, shoplifting or whatever you know or breaking and entering into a car or something like that but if you've done it three times then bang that's it you get a three-year sentence, and during that three-year sentence, you are not, although you're in prison, you're not specifically just locked in your cell playing Xbox. You're out there involved in a rehabilitation program that will last three years, during which you're assessed for the first six months to decide exactly what your needs are. You know, if, if you're illiterate, enumerate, uh, whatever it is, and you're put onto a program to prepare you to function in society. So the minimum sentence will be three years. And you don't just employ uh, any old body. As people going on, on YouTube advertising for the Home Office say, anybody can be a prison officer. Well, it should be something that you're actually qualified to do. You know, and I would say that they, they need to have two tiers in the prison system. They need the big physical boys who are going to actually police the system. And they need people who are going to educate, teach and train the inmates to rehabilitate themselves in society. So it will be a two tier system. And a, a two tier system that is enforced, vigorously enforced. And listen, none of these wet-behind-the-ears uh, assistant governor types uh, who are saying, oh, you've used too much force. The amount of force that has to be used in the prisons is sufficient force. And that's my sixpenneth for today. Tales from the jails. And I'm now going to... Yes, I'm going to sing to you folks. Because, believe it or not, the other day I sang a little verse from this and it proved to be very popular. Not I'm telling you who it was very popular with, but it was very popular. And, and this is uh, a Scottish soldier, originally sung, well, a part of it, one of it was sung by Andy Stewart. He used to have a, a show on television when I was a young man, The White Heather Club, with Andy Stewart, yeah. This is a Scottish soldier. So, you can sing along if you will. Larry, you can sing along. Uh, Kathleen, I've not heard from you for a bit. How are you doing anyway? And of course, Laura will be up there on the moors with the wild haggis singing this song. There was a soldier, a Scottish soldier, who wandered far away and soldiered far away. 
There was none bolder, with good broad shoulder, he fought in many a fray, and fought and won. He'd seen the glory, and told the story, of battle's glorious, and deeds victorious. Now he's sighing, his heart is crying, to leave those green hills of Tyrol. Because those green hills, they're not myland hills, they're not highland hills, they're not my land's hills. And fair as those foreign hills may be, they are not the hills of home. And now this soldier, this Scottish soldier, who wandered far away, and soldiered far away, sea leaves are falling, and death is calling, he will fade away in that far land. He called his piper, his trusty piper, and bade him sound a lay, a pibrook sad to play, upon a hillside, a Scottish hillside, not on those green hills of Tyrol. And so this soldier, this Scottish soldier will wander far no more, and soldier far no more. And on a hillside, a Scottish hillside, you'll hear a piper play his soldier home. He'd seen the glory, he told the story of battles glorious, and he's victorious. The bugle sees now, he is at peace now, far from those green hills of Tyrol. There you go. The Scottish soldier, as originally sung by Andy Stewart, who might have made a better job of it than me. Who knows? Tales from the Jails. Do like and subscribe. And don't forget to have a look at some of the interviews I've linked below. Thank you very much.